Hello and welcome to the ELECTS webinar, Legal Issues and Licensing Electronic Resources. This is part five of the six-part series, Licensing Electronic Resources to Serve the Library's Mission. I'm Lisa Lorenzo, a member of the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Tom Lipinski. Tom is the Dean of the School of Information Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He holds a Juris Doctor, Master of Laws, and PhD. A lawyer and librarian, he teaches and writes on the legal issues affecting information organizations. In 2006, he was the first named Global Law Fellow, Faculty of Law, Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium, where he continues to lecture annually at its Center for IT and IP Law. The Librarian's Legal Companion for Licensing Information Resources and Services was published by Neil Schumann ALA Editions in 2012. He brings much expertise to today's topic and we are fortunate to have him with us today. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is ALCTSCE. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for our presenter, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now, here's Tom. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Well, thank you very much and welcome to everybody for attending uh, this uh, seminar in this series of topics related to licensing. And um, I will begin by a, a bit of a disclaimer um, because uh, I am a licensed attorney and still wear that hat on occasion. So uh, I'm going to say that I'm just here to give you legal information uh, today and that uh, when we move into Q&A, the questions you have uh, are completely hypothetical and not something that you've done or think are thinking of doing uh, in your library. So we'll talk today about uh, some nuts and bolts in terms of service in license agreements. And um, basically a license is a type of legal permission. And libraries uh, can um, uh, be faced with two types of, of licenses. We may be more familiar with the second type, those that we negotiate with uh, our vendors for our products and services. But increasingly, uh, libraries and their patrons uh, are seeing mass market licenses or non-negotiable licenses. Uh, these are uh, licenses anytime you are updating some software, uh, there's, a, there's a new version available and you have to click, uh, click to agree. Uh, so that's a very common circumstance and it does make a difference uh, which um, uh, license you're faced with uh, and I'll show you uh, and discuss a couple of those differences in, in a few slides. Uh, when we want to look at the uh, legal impact of various license terms, um, we want to keep an eye on the practical side of, of that as well. So we're really asking a number of different questions, uh, primarily what responsibilities are imposed on the library, the licensee, uh, or sometimes even your patrons. Uh, likewise, what additional rights have we gained in the license agreement? And, and maybe a question to also ask is what rights have been taken away? And we'll show you some examples of those uh, provisions in, in practice. And really answering those questions and others about a license agreement um, requires you know a little bit about con copyright law, but also primarily the basics of contract law. So we'll cover some of those nuts and bolts. Contract law is really the anticipation of the unforeseen. And um, so, always trying to think what's the worst thing that can happen um, and does the agreement speak to that or prepare me to do that. And when we look at license agreements that we're presented with um, and uh, as, as the library, um, licensors often try and shift the legal risk. 
and responsibility from themselves um, on to the library. Um, and they have a number of different risk shifting strategies, and we'll look at some of those. Um, a very common one is to disclaim uh, any warranties. Um, uh, another uh, might be to um, um, have terms not only that are favorable to them, but the ability to change terms without any notifications. There's lots of those traps in various license agreements, and we'll take a look at some examples of those. And they might impose obligations, obligations to help them keep their content um, secure. So we'll look at examples of, of those as, as well. And I'm going to maybe move through this material in hopefully a somewhat logical way of how it might appear uh, in a license agreement in a, in a contract. And the first type of clause you might run into are known as whereas clauses. Um, and you're probably not going to see these maybe in a database agreement, but if you're negotiating a, um, a service agreement say for a library system or some type of management software, uh, there may be some negotiation in there, of course, and there may be these whereas clauses. Um, they don't really have any legal effect, but they should be accurate. Um, and you have to understand too that if you're in a, a, a contract environment, a license environment, where you have these whereas clauses, they're gonna be the most read clause um, of the agreement because some people are their eyes will glaze over on about page two or three um, but they'll at least have gotten through the first page um, so they, they should be accurate um, and they typically set out um, the, the what the whom the why um, but they are in themselves not considered uh, binding um, <clears throat> if you go to the very end of a, of a contract or a license agreement, um, there's going to be some line for a signature. And you want to make sure that the person that signs the contract um, has the authority to do so um, under sort of the a law of what we call agency and or agent and principle. Um, the, the agent must have the authority to bind the principal. So make sure that the proper person is signing that agreement. And there are often statutes in every state, especially about government contracts, um, and that the and a government agency can disavow the unauthorized promises if the agent did not have the authority uh, authority to do that. One major concept that I'd like to introduce, which may not. Um, have been on your radar screen before, but it is operative in just about every license agreement that I've ever looked at or contract, and that is understanding the difference between a covenant and a, and a condition. And so an independent promise um, is known as a covenant. And um, a, a covenant, if it's broken, gives rise to uh, possibly damages or some type of injunctive relief. So what would be an example of a promise? Um, here's one. Vendor agrees to provide access to ABC electronic resource upon payment of the annual license fee within 30 days of invoice. So they're making a promise to provide access to the material um, when you pay the agreement. Um, and failure to pay the agree to, to pay the annual fee um, gives rise is, is a breach. Typically, payment uh, is a material term, um, and so there would be a legal remedy that they could they could pursue, um, as opposed to a condition. And a condition really doesn't give rise to an enforceable promise. Uh, conditions can be either uh, condition uh, precedent, which is if something happens on condition, uh, it gives rise to an obligation. A condition that releases you from an obligation or a performance is known as a condition subsequent. And here's an example of a condition precedent. 
I'll sell you the second edition at a 25% discount if it's still in print. That's a condition. The condition, the book still being in print, triggers the promise to sell it at the 25% discount. Whether the book is still in print or not is not an enforceable right. In other words, you couldn't, if the book is not in print, force the, the vendor to print more copies. It simply means that the book is no longer in print and they don't have the obligation to then sell it to you at a 25% discount. An example of a condition precedent, uh, excuse me, subsequent might be, if the circulation module operates error-free for a period of 30 days after installation, the commitment to provide installation service support is hereby fulfilled. So once the module or the system works fine for 30 days, then they're no longer going to give you startup support. Um, another example of a condition subsequent might be, once the number of downloads exceeds 100 in a calendar year, the ebook will no longer be accessible. Uh, again, so they have an obligation to make it available for 100 downloads, and then once that event occurs, um, it releases them from further performance. Um, so you will see those in license agreements and contracts, and sometimes you might even have a provision that, that is both a covenant and a condition. Um, these are a little more complex, but uh, for example, it might say something like, um, if a licensee monitors authorized users' compliance with the terms, you may use the contents uh, to fill interlibrary loan and create course backs. Um, so you have an obligation then to monitor, um, but um, if you break that obligation, that promise, um, then um, your use of the course pack is no longer authorized um, and it may give rise to the ability to also um, seek remedy uh, on, on their behalf. So those are probably the most complex concepts we're going to talk about today, but you will um, see them from in license agreements and be able to uh, identify them. Uh, another concept I'd like to introduce is, uh, and uh, again, seen many, many license agreements, is the difference between the phrase reasonable efforts and best efforts. Reasonable efforts um, are sort of, what is the industry standard? You have to ask, act reasonably. So what would a normal library do in a particular situation? Uh, that's reasonable efforts. Sometimes you will see best efforts, um, or you may even see best endeavors. Uh, endeavor is usually used more in contracts coming from the UK or overseas. Um, and that means a higher standard of behavior. And if you, if you do see that in a proposed license agreement or contract, you should have that term defined because courts vary in how they interpret it. Um, one example is, is on the screen, care and diligence necessary to further the intentions. But if it's not defined, um, there was uh, some case law that suggests that it's, it's going so far and above and beyond uh, what is reasonable that it's almost to the detriment of the actor uh, of the library. And so um, caution about using best efforts uh, standards, both are legal terms of, of art, uh, and they do have meaning when courts need to interpret uh, the contract. So here's some examples in action, and I've always indicated uh, in the slides if it's not evident in the language itself where it came from. So this was from Balker book, Books in Print. Um, reasonable efforts to inform authorized users of the restrictions and to enforce reasonable efforts. And you can think about reasonable efforts as the standard of, of, of care and responsibility that you would take with other types of policies you might have. So this one is about informing users of the restrictions uh, over the products and, and the content. Um, what would you normally do if you had, say, an acceptable use pol policy for network and computer use uh, in your library? Um, what would you do if somebody is breaking it? 
um, what are the standards of, of care that you normally take to make sure that, that is, uh, those obligations by your users are met. Um, here's a best efforts one um, by bio one. Um, and fortunately it's not um, about compliance, it's really about if the license should be assigned, bio one's gonna use the best efforts to make sure that you get the same terms conditions from the successor. Um, so it's not as significant an impact there, but in the bulk of books and print, if you were to replace reasonable efforts with best efforts, um, you would be under some significant obligations to not only inform, but enforce. And I'll say a little bit more about enforcement later when we talk about the impact of some provisions on patron privacy. Uh, a couple more examples. Um, again, these are uh, having to do with the downtime and maintenance. Uh, so Elsevier aims to keep the site available. Uh, that's really great. I aim to retire at 60. That's not going to happen for me. Um, so this kind of a phrase really doesn't mean much. Um, they, this is their intent, but they're not going to be liable for any lost information or the non-availability of the service. Classic example of, of risk shifting. Um, shifting their their ability and their obligation to make the service available that you paid for. Um, Greenwood Press, here's reasonable efforts. Um, and you can find similar provisions like this across various agreements, and they're all a little different. You know, Elsevier, seven days, 24 hours, Greenwood, 98%, some say 95%. I mean, it really just varies, and it's more an awareness of realizing, okay, what sorts of protections is the licensor building into their provisions so that they can risk that, shift that risk of, of responsibility. Um, one more example, uh, this is a best endeavors um, um, requirement and uh, it's from Nature uh, Corporate. Um, and another example uh, um, without really any, any standard other than you shall disable all products in your possession. And these both phrases have to do with destroying any content that you might have. And I would argue that that is, is almost an impossible task to do. Um, this is where you might wanna have a, at least a reasonable efforts, but no more than that. Um, best endeavors, that's gonna require quite a bit of um, obligation on your part. And the CSA Lumina doesn't even have a standard, it just simply says you shall destroy all products. That's that's the standard you're gonna be held to. Almost an impossible standard. Uh, a more reasonable approach is to say, well, we'll use reasonable efforts to inform our users that they should destroy the product consistent with other types of notices that you would give to your users. Your password is expiring in six days, please change it. And you send that notice out on the sixth day, the fifth day, the fourth day, the third day, and maybe that's what you normally do. Um, that's a more logical and reasonable response to requests to destroy uh, content, I think. Um, sometimes you will get um, uh, changes um, and notice and um, refund. And Greenwood Press, for example, they don't give you any notice. Um, that they're gonna change the content. Um, Bio One, they're giving you notice, but you don't get any refund. And it's, it's logical for a licensee to say, you know, we might have to add content or modify it or delete it at, at a time, especially if they're an aggregator, because they are themselves licensees with the direct source of a lot of the content. So they need to be able to have some ability to withdraw content, that's logical, but they should be giving you a notice of it. And in certain circumstances, they should be giving you a refund um, because it may be that the one reason you subscribe to that service is to get you know this handful of titles from this particular publisher. And if, your licensor or aggregator loses the ability to make that material available, maybe that license agreement really isn't valuable to you anymore. Um, and, or the loss is, is significant in some other way. So um, 
Springer is offering you a, a refund of that portion that's in proportion if they have to uh, remove some content. So you, you really should get a notice um, and, and a, a refund in, in certain circumstances. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, some license agreements will, instead of a refund, <clears throat> they will give you a credit in time. And that can be acceptable, but you just have to understand that that may change your renewal date. So if they're giving you a credit, maybe for downtime or for loss of content, and it's pushing out your renewal date, you have to be able to track that and make sure because oftentimes the ability to um, cancel is triggered within a window um, so many days before the renewal date. And so if the renewal date's shifted, um, it might change the window of notice period from which you are able to cancel. And I've seen anywhere from 90 days to 30 days. Um, so again, a wide variety uh, of practices. What about changing terms? Often, as I mentioned, licensors need to change the content because they no longer have the ability to supply that content to you. But some may change the terms as well. How do they change the terms? Many just simply post on the website. Um, what's interesting about the Gartner example is it's effective immediately upon notice and how is the notice similar to Cengage? Well, we'll put it on the website. Um, it might be more effective to actually send you notice and say the terms have changed, please see our website. Notice also in the Gartner Agreement, the very last sentence, use equals acceptance. Use of the products after the notice has been posted which you don't know because they're not telling you that they're posting new terms on the website. So you use the product as you normally do every day. Now suddenly that's going to be deemed to be acceptance. And you will see use equals acceptance almost um, in every mass market or consumer agreement, a non-negotiated agreement. Cloud services use that, for example. Um, many, many other types of repositories and open data sources will even use that. Use equals acceptance of the terms. So you, you have to be aware of the significance of, of that. Here's one place where the difference between a negotiated contract and a non-negotiated contract or a consumer mass market contract has some impact. So there was a case a number of years ago from the Ninth Circuit, so this is all the, the West Coast, um, that said, and it was in, involving a service, um, that they took the practice of putting changes on their website um, and not necessarily telling their users, hey, there have been changes, please consult our website. Uh, and the court, in a very strong opinion in, for consumer rights uh, involving licenses, said, no, those changes are not effective. Um, because in a mass market, there's no mass market agreement, there's no ability to negotiate. Those were terms that were just handed to you in a take it or leave it fashion. That's the nature of these non-negotiated contracts. And the court said parties have no obligation to check the terms on a periodic basis. Um, Douglas would have had to check the contract every day for possible changes. That would be fairly cumbersome in the words of the court. So they have a little more freedom or wiggle room or protection uh, with non-negotiated agreements in terms of change. Um, in a negotiated agreement, the rule generally is that between merchants, changes can be effective unless they materially alter the agreement. Um, and in procuring information, products and services, a library is probably a merchant under the law. Uh, when they buy light bulbs and cleaning supplies, probably not. But our stock and trade is information. Um, so we'll probably be held to a merchant standard. Uh, unless it's in the contract that says any changes must be specifically agreed to. <clears throat> 
here's another example from ArtStore. Yes, they can amend the terms, but if there is a material change, and you can define what are material terms, typically an agreement price will be a material term. An example of a non-material term might be, well, we're changing our billing date from the first of the month to the fifth of the month. That's something really minor. But the content that you're going to be licensing, for example, and the price that you're going to be paying for that, those are likely material terms. You should also define in your license agreement the form of proper notice. Is posting on their website, as we saw in the previous examples, acceptable? Or must it be an email or fax or some other type of notice? Second, when is the notice effective? Is it effective when the licensor sends it to you? Or is it effective when you receive it and read it? Um, so you do have those types of choices. And I do see some license agreements that have actually taken the time to define the form of notice, what's acceptable, and when it will be uh, effective. We mentioned in the beginning that understanding certain terms of, of a license agreement involves knowing a little bit of contract law. And so there are a number of provisions that can take away rights that you have under the contract law. And I'll show you a few examples of those and then mention the copyright provision or right that a library would normally have. And in negotiated agreements, the general rule is that if you have agreed to some restriction on a use that the copyright law would otherwise allow, you are held to that restriction because you had the ability. So one right that libraries have is known as the first sale doctrine or in the rest of the world exhaustion. And it basically means that once the first sale of that item has occurred, you've purchased it, you've purchased a library book or other item for your physical collection, um, you have now the ability to make a public distribution of it. That's what allows libraries to circulate their materials. So there is this concept in copyright law. And um, here's an example of, of something that pulls back on that right. Um, American Camel Society says you're not to forward, transfer, sell, or rent any of the contents of our um, product to any third party. Um, that is a significant restriction. And it's been said by our U.S. Supreme Court that a licensee um, does not have any first sale rights. So, so this is a little bit of the context in the debate about so-called digital first sale rights. And the courts would not be supportive of looking at a, a licensed scenario and say, oh, you have first sale rights. Um, a lot of provisions take those rights away anyways, and the courts would say, yes, that's perfectly acceptable because really you don't have any first sale rights uh, as a licensee. Two other areas, uh, these impact section uh, 108, which is the main library provision, the provision that allows libraries to preserve materials, to make replacements, to engage in interlibrary loan. Here are two provisions that sort of turn that back. Um, CSA Lumina, um, you um, shall destroy again after after our agreement ends. Um, you basically don't get to keep anything. Um, more and more agreements are allowing for that type of an archiving, um, but many still do not. Or Nature Academic is impacting your ability to engage in electronic interlibrary loan. Uh, they're allowing you to make those distributions, um, but only in hard copy form, not electronically. Um, and it, Section 108 would give you the right to engage in e <coughs> interlibrary loan. Section 110, provision of the copyright law that allows 
teachers and students to uh, make public performances of material in the classroom if it's related to the subject matter of the class. Here's a simple example from iTunes. Uh, you can only use the product for personal use. Uh, and use in a classroom is probably a public use, not a private or personal use. Uh, we see uh, more and more restrictions on data mining. Because of the Google litigation and the Hathi Trust litigation involving the Authors Guild, uh, several courts have said now that data mining is fair use. Uh, or that making copies in order to be able to mine the data uh, or to tell the relevance of particular data or information to a patron is fair use. This is turning that right back. Similarly, we've had uh, some fair use uh, case law uh, as well as um, a federal regulation um, under uh, Section 1201 of the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, those are the circumvention rules and anti-circumvention rules. Uh, and uh, we've had um, some movement from the U.S. Copyright Office and the Library of Congress, um, for example, in the most recent rulemaking in 2015, uh, new rules should be coming out uh, this fall. Um, circumvention is accomplished for the sole purpose of enabling interoperability. Uh, and this had to do with smartphone uh, or device and to permit the removal, removal of software from smartphone or device. So there is a growing sentiment that accessing content, copying content, tinkering with content for purposes of interoperability can in some circumstances be fair use. Um, here, Kindle is telling you, no, you've got to use this only on our devices. Um, you can't figure out a way to get that content um, on your phone. Um, so we're going to see, I think, more and more pressure um, to push back some rights that have been hard fought under the copyright law. This is a, a savings clause uh, often seen in, in agreements. Um, and here's an example of one. Um, any rights not granted to you, we're keeping. And you may look at that and say, oh, that doesn't sound good. Well, the case law on such provisions said says that it really has no legal effect. It, it can't, by its silence, take away rights. Now, that's different from some of the provisions we just looked at that specifically are taking away certain fair use rights, preservation rights, interlibrary loan rights. But a blanket statement like this simply can't pull back rights. It's not elucidating. Um, in the words of, a, of another court um, involving Random House and Rosetta Books, the court says such reservation clauses, unless they expressly cover the new use in question, contribute nothing to the definition of the boundaries of the license. So they, these may be put in to sort of scare you, um, but they really have no legal uh, impact. And there is um, an excellent report on international interlibrary loan written by Brandon Butler, um, and he discusses these types of provisions as well. It was published um, by the Task Force on International Interlibrary Loan, it's an ARL publication. And incidentally, all these uh, additional um, quotations and sources that I'm citing, uh, when you get the slides, open up the notes page, because many of these slides have notes like that with those citations there. So if you want to do a little more reading or follow up, uh, you, can, you can do that as well. So a few more uh, provisions to cover. Um, before we go into our Q&A, often you'll see um, a warranty, okay, a promise um, that are often disclaimed. So risk shifting, sometimes words like as is, or they might be disclaiming a warranty of mercantility or fitness for a particular purpose. Again, they're trying to push the risk and their obligation um, on to anyone else but themselves. Um, 
So one thing that I would say, um, and this is very typical, the, the, these types of warranty disclaimers, they're usually in capitals, um, not because they're trying to shout at you, but because the law says that any disclaimer of warranties um, must be conspicuous. So that's why that language is always capitalized in contracts. And um, it's very understandable that um, a warranty that something is as is or that it is not necessarily error free, if it's content, that's very understandable because things will have errors in them. If it's for a service, you might want to be, such as a software support service, you might want to be a little more cautious about taking something as is. You'd want some type of obligations in there to make sure that, that the software is working. One type of warranty that you must have is a warranty of non-infringement. Elsevier disclaims that warranty. Why do you need that warranty? Because if you are being given from a licensor infringing content, when you use that content, you likely will be a copyright infringer as well. So if they're giving you content, if it's for content, uh, database, some other type of content, you need to get a warranty of non-infringement. Now, warranties can be either conditional or absolute. Here's an example of a conditional one known as best knowledge warranties. Springer warrants that to the best of its knowledge, use by the licensee will not infringe. All right, well, best knowledge warranties really may be just as useless, unless you have an extremely, extremely knowledgeable licensor. But to the best of your knowledge means that they only have to warrant against known infringements in that case. Here's an absolute warranty. This is what you want. Greenwood Press, the licensor represents, it has the right and authority to make the content available and that by providing it, it's not going to infringe. Simple, straightforward, gives you the warranty of non-infringement. But that warrant is really useless unless there is an indemnification to go with it. In other words, okay, I'm going to promise and warrant that this content is not infringing, but, but what if I'm wrong? And you're using it, then you might be sued. So what an indemnification does is, is it completes the circle. It says, I'm promising you the content is not infringing, and if I'm wrong, I'm basically going to cover your damages. Um, and you really need both, and you really need them to survive. You'll see many provisions that will say in the license agreement, you know, sections A, B, J, K, and, and Y survive this agreement. And that's okay. It's actually important if one of the provisions that are surviving the contract or the license is the warranty of non-infringement and the indemnification clause. You want that protection. You want it, You want that clause, those clauses to stay in force at least for three years because that's the, that's the duration of a copyright uh, statute of limitations for civil, five years for criminal. Um, so here's another example. Um, this is unacceptable because Ovid is asking you to indemnify it. That's not the way the indemnification is supposed to work. The provider of the content is supposed to promise and make that warrant of non-infringement and then indemnify you. So this is a more typical clause, an indemnification clause. Users harmless for any losses, claim damages, awards, penalties, injuries incurred that would arise from any claim made by any third party of any alleged infringement of copyright. And typically those provisions might come with some obligations um, to uh, perhaps participate um, and cooperate in the, in the litigation should you be sued, um, to notify them if you're being sued for using their content that someone is now claiming. 
um, to be infringing, uh, and that's those are perfectly acceptable provisions to also in, include. Um, winding uh, up uh, now, um, there is one final risk shifting option, uh, and that is um, to reduce the damages or to eliminate the range of damages seeking behavior you can engage in. So binding arbitration usually means you can't you can't sue. You have to go to arbitration. Typical in a lot of um, cloud computing and, and other sorts of services, uh, we're going to limit the damages to the amount that you've paid for the subscription price. And I've seen that in database agreements um, as, as well. Some provisions can have an impact on other rights unrelated to copyright. So some provisions might impact patron privacy. So Art Store says no monitoring. You don't have an obligation to monitor. Make sure that people are complying. Your authorized users are complying with the terms. Nature requires you to monitor. And it, notice it doesn't say reasonable efforts to monitor. Maybe it should. It just says, you know, you're going to do, you're going to have in place reasonable procedures to monitor and comply. Uh, so the, um, here's another example from Bio One: no monitoring and use of reasonable efforts to ensure that users are made aware. That's good. But later on, if you should find that someone is not in compliance, once you become aware, you've got to tell us. And that's going to impact what happens next. Because if you tell a vendor, you know, we notice that somebody downloaded substantial portions of your um, content last week. The very next question they're going to ask, well, can you tell me who that is? Um, and, and this was a situation that, that actually did develop. Uh, involving JSTOR, which had what's known as a self-help. They could suspend if they felt that you were not cooperating uh, with um, the compliance efforts that, that, uh, that they were trying to undertake. And um, they have had the right to, to suspend. And, and they felt that MIT, the library, was not cooperating to the extent that they should. And they basically suspended their access for several days. Um, so Self-help can be a very um, significant remedy and, again, another way to shift risk. Um, <clears throat> often the party in breach will have a cure right or a right to cure. And so in a situation like the JSTOR agreement, it would have been nice to have the cure right to say, okay, um, the breaching party shall have 30 days from the receipt of notice to cure and to notify the non-breaching party in writing that cure has been effected. Good. Um, I'd probably insert also a sentence that says, and receive confirmation that the cure is acceptable because you may be in a situation like this, you fix the problem, you think it's fixed, and the vendor doesn't think it's fixed. Um, so um, often uh, a breach, material breach, has a termination right with it. Uh, that is that's typical. Um, one last loss of right is um, the uh, loss of speech rights. So here's two examples where that can happen. One is a little more subtle than the other. That's the first one. Sometimes these are called gag wrap provisions. Um, you can't undertake any activity that might have a damaging effect on the licensor's ability to achieve revenue. And I've seen this in a, in a handful of license agreements. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, what if you were on a listserv and somebody said, hey, you know, did, has anybody used version six of XYZ service? Um, and 10 people respond and say, oh, don't get the upgrade. Wait till seven comes out. We, we, we tried to use it and it crashed our systems. Don't get it. Um, well, that person who made that response to the question just had a damaging effect on the licensor's ability to achieve revenue <coughs> if they were themselves bound by this provision. And you see also, here's one from Wiley, often terms that are negotiated or price 
um, must be kept confidential. And so it's understandable that certain things want to, uh, that a vendor wants to keep, um, especially price confidential. But I think the thing to maybe do in these sorts of situations is to identify the concern of the licensor. And like in the first situation, you still want to be able to make a product review um, or inform others about maybe what's good and what's not good about the content. Um, get the ability, have the ability to, to do that and then agree to give the licensor notice. That we, I'm posting a review of your product um, and you might want to respond um, and, and, and they have the ability to do that if they, if they want. The last um, <clears throat> set of provisions um, are what's known as boilerplate and I'll quickly go through these. Integration clause is basically, I call it, a see, what you see is what you get provision. It's basically telling you that any other agreement before this doesn't matter. It's really this current agreement. Choice of form, choice of law. If we do have a dispute, where do we do that? Which state, which court? Oftentimes, uh, public institutions uh, must have the state of their uh, residence. They can't, they, you can't be in Wisconsin and have a choice of law be California. Um, our attorney general doesn't allow me to sign contracts like that. Force majeure allows the suspension of the contract uh, or their obligations if it's a act of nature, um, act of God natural disasters, sometimes man-made. Severability basically means that if something is held to be unenforceable, the rest of the contract still stays in place. Non-waiver provision is one that will say, well, because we didn't enforce our rights in one provision doesn't mean that we don't have the right to enforce it the next time. And the headings of sections is basically they have no legal impact, they can't be misleading. What's really um, operative is the actual provisions, not the headings. So just in review, do retain and use all rights that you would have under the copyright law. If you can, secure additional use rights beyond those in the copyright law. Retain access to content after cessation of service and obtain that warranty of non-infringement and indemnification. Do not or at least avoid as much as possible surrendering user rights you would have under the copyright law. Agree to compromise patron privacy. Don't indemnify the licensor. Agree that use of a service equates to assent, or at least be aware of the impact of that. And be aware also of the impact of disclaimers, waivers, and other indemnifications uh, that can shift the risk away from the licensor onto the licensee. So I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions, um, and I'm happy to um, entertain a few questions if you have them. I, I thank you for um, attending the session today, and um, as I said, you will um, have the slides. So do uh, look at the note pages. There's a bit more information uh, in there, at least in terms of other resources and references. So. Thank you, Tom. This has been really interesting and informative. Um, so we do now have time for questions. Um, if you have not yet done so, please go ahead and type your questions into the question box. Um, we do have one that came in already. Um, I'll just go ahead and ask that. How would you recommend tactfully renegotiating language that your institution either cannot agree to or simply should not agree to? Well, I think there's a, a couple of different um, strategies or things that you should should have uh, thought of before you kind of make up that phone call and you want to tactfully renegotiate. Um, I think one, you, you have to know uh, wh what is your, what's your end point? At what point will, are you going to be willing to walk away? Um, because in any negotiation, if you don't, um, if, if they know they have you, you're not going to be very successful. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, um, if I had a contract in place, I uh, came into a situation and I, I, I see, oh, wow, this is really not a very good license agreement, um, I would call them up and, and be straightforward and, and say, you know, we've um, uh, now that we've been 
uh, in this agreement for X number, we've, we're realizing a number of things aren't working, um, and we'd like the opportunity to, to renegotiate. Um, and one of the things that I've always tried to do is to, is to understand what the motivation is behind a particular provision. Um, and, and so, you know, they th think of the monitoring provisions that we've looked at. They, they may just be concerned that you're just, you know, the wild, wild west at your institution. And it may be just a matter of saying, well, here's what we can do that's, that's reasonable. Um, and here's what I'm not prepared to do. Um, so I, I, if I were in a situation like that, I would just simply call them up and say, circumstances have changed. We've been using the product or the service for a while. We've been encountering a number of problems, um, and we don't think this is going to be workable. Um, and you have to be prepared in your own mind to say, well, if they're not going to negotiate, renegotiate now, then at the end of the term of the agreement, we're not going to renew. Um, and, um, you know, to, to to let them know that if it comes to that, that that's what will happen, and they may be more encouraged to um, um, sit down and, and, and negotiate. And some some vendors won't. I mean, they're, they're, that's why there are some libraries that they're just a, there's a do not license list of, of vendors that they just won't use because they're that unreasonable. Um, so those are a couple of things that I would that I would think of. I hope hope that was helpful. Um, there's also, um, I don't have these in my notes, but there's some very good um, materials out there by um, Leslie Harris has written a lot about negotiating, and I believe she has a licensing book out from ALA uh, that has some of those nuts and bolts about um, the, the practical side of, of negotiating these agreements. Okay. But thank you, great question. Yeah, thanks. Um, someone else asked, what about ADA compliance? In terms of a vendor's a, a license agreement, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, that you you want to make sure that their content is is their websites and their um, other agreements are ADA compliant. Um, what you could do, um, and this would be a, a similar strategy you could take with patron privacy um, and, and other types of uh, rights uh, for patrons that are often derived from other places in the law, so like the American with Disabilities Act or library confidentiality statutes. And what you, you could do is attempt to, I mean, you have to determine whether the vendor's sites um, are ADA compliant, and you're probably not going to get them to, to to do that if, if you know, if, if they're not willing to do it. But the kind of phrase that, uh, clause that you could use is um, uh, to make reference to um, whether it's a state or you're talking about the federal uh, disability laws that um, um, vendors products and website will conform to uh, standards as um, indicated in, and then you would cite the regulation or the statute or um, with respect to say privacy, for example, you might cite your state privacy statute, library confidentiality statute, um, that vendor must comply with the same standards. Um, so that that would be one strategy that that I could that I could think of, and you may get some vendors that just they're 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 not compliant that way, um, um, and and then you have to we have to be willing to say, well, you know that's a hard and fast for us. Um, and um, uh, you'd want a provision, uh, as I said in there, that would make reference to those types of standards that you that you want to have uh, available for your for your patrons. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, that person had a follow up question, which was, can we require vendors to offer ADA compliant content? Uh, yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, I don't think. Um, I'm not sure if, if you could make that requirement. Um, I'm I'm not as super up on the ADA, but um, it, it it still is a choice for a, a a lot of vendors to to do it or not do it. Um, 
but you could let them know. I mean, the, the first question we had about tactfully renegotiating, you know, a, a, th a list of priorities for you that, that it must have, um, that the agreement must have, and then you need to be willing to walk away. If you're never willing to walk away, you, you, you really don't have any leverage anymore. Um, but that can certainly be on the list of things that, that need to be um, uh, available to um, your authorized users. Thank you. Um, I think we maybe have time for one more quick question if anyone else has one to enter and can do it in the next few seconds. I'll just wait briefly, just in case. Um, all right, otherwise, I think, okay, I think that's everything then. Okay. So thank you so much, Tom. Oh, my pleasure. And um, I, I believe you'll, you have my contact information so that if a question does percolate, uh, in the future, uh, you know, don't hesitate to send me an email or uh, give me a call if we need to go into something a little more detail. I'm always available. I'll, um, uh, tell all my attendees that, that you know you get your one free phone call. So um, I'm I'm happy to follow up uh, as needed or send you some other resources and things of that sort. So th thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we are glad everyone could be with us today. Uh, you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee plan for future events. The email will also include links to today's slides and recording. You now have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. That information will also be in the email. So thank you again to our presenter, Tom Lipinski. Thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Committee Felicity Dykus and Wanda Jazieri, and to Alana Warren and Megan Doherty from the ELECT's office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. ELECT has other continuing education events coming up. The sixth and final part of the Licensing Electronic Resources to Serve the Library's Mission series will take place on October 3rd. See the ELECT's website to register or find more information on this and other upcoming webinars. ELECT also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-form will be on October 16th, discussing outward-facing technical services. Please check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you all again for joining us today. This concludes our session.